Today's topic is fantasy foods, both what might we want to eat, what have people put in in terms of stories for interesting food ideas, and then also from the other side, you know, how might we be part of the food chain? I say anything goes. And we're going to start with introductions. So I'll introduce myself and then I'm just going to call out on our panelists in the order you show up on my screen. So um, I'm Charlotte Lewis Brown. I'm a paleontologist. I've got just a little bit of biology background, but I've got a couple books on dinosaurs out there. So I thought I'd be pulling in some of the changes to the food web that we've seen in some ways that they were worked into stories. Um, Ricky, I think you're the real star here. What? <laughs> yes. Well, you've got actual uh, food on your picture. I do. Uh, well, I, I, I go by Dr. Ricky on the internet. I am a working scientist, a molecular biologist, and microbiologist. And uh, I happen to try to teach science through food. So food is of great interest to me. Jake. Take it away. Uh, I am a... Uh high school science teacher, all topics at one point in time or another. And luckily, luckily the, the upside to this whole last two months is now I can say I am also an online science teacher. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> um, as far as food, I've always found it interesting that we talk about food, but yet don't understand how much we are food on a daily basis for everything that lives on us. Tom. Uh, I have a degree in zoology. I ran a science fiction bookstore for about 30 years called The Other Change of Hobbit. I have read more science fiction than most people have, and I tend to remember it pretty well. So I'll be bringing in a lot of classic stuff and a lot of, uh, not, not so much current, but a lot of thoughts about the ways people have done it. And of course, with everyone else, I have to mention uh, Damon Knight's To Serve Man. <laughs> of course. <It's>, uh, <laughs> about humans being food. Um, but there's a lot of stuff about humans being food out there. You know, we... Oh, are we starting with this? I guess we are. <laughs> yeah, well, it works. Uh, I'm gonna leave the title up just a little bit, but we got the alien face hugger up in the corner there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's one of our deepest nightmares. What's gonna come and eat you essentially, right? Well, to tie back to the previous panel that we did on plagues, that's something coming to eat us, <laughs> right? The coronavirus is well, living uh, on us. We are, in effect, its food, as well as its reproductive system. Oh, I, I'm, like, I'm not sure that we have a taste for virus. <laughs> like, hey, you think about it, like how many stories are there where humans are preferred food? Pretty rare. There are there are several, but um, it's not the big it's not the big the big picture thing. Larry Niven's uh, Kazin in the Soft Weapon are taking apart one of the humans as food because humans are considered prey to the Kazindi, and they definitely wanted to eat one of the people. Right. Uh, there's a there's definitely a example. There's definitely a story about uh, cultivated humans, like yes, you know, if, if well, humans more than one. were. Were, um, were were domesticated enough to be as docile as cows. Oh yeah, we actually we actually talked about that in one of our panels a few years ago. Pierre's Anthony short story. Uh, uh, to some extent, the um, yahoos in Gulliver's Travels. They don't actually talk about them being food, but they are domesticated animals. Then again, I, I wrote an entire piece on um, culturally acceptable cannibalism. Mm -hmm. Where, where um, it's not even fiction that humans eat human things uh, and it's culturally acceptable. Uh, mm -hmm. The easiest ones are, say, nail biting, you know, where it's usually the same person. Uh, there is a yeah, if you're biting somebody else's nails, that's usually a little yeah, bit. It gets a little icky. <laughs> it's probably out there somewhere. I'm not judging. But, I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's a little <laughs> bit socially trickier. Yeah. So there's a there's an actual cookbook out there called A Bountiful Harvest, and that's an entire cookbook on on cooking semen. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. It's an Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the question, Ricky. With all the with all the cultural thing, with all the cultural tie-ins, oh, like cultural yeah. acceptable uh, cannibalism, is there any documentation? Do we taste like chicken? <laughs> Everything tastes like chicken. <laughs> well, depends on what you mean. Like the standard thing that human meat is compared to is pork. Right, uh, long, long pig. pig being the what they I, say. I, I, you know. I, this is all historic. How about we go and before we like chase away all our audience, talk about <laughs> okay. maybe something fun. Um, we, can return, we can return to cannibalism later. Eating people is wrong? Are you telling me that? I did. I said fun. I did. I was not judging. However, can we're we all laughing. There's a swan in the background about the, the chorus of cannibals. High in um, science fiction fantasy foods uh favorite examples of something taken to an extreme and i'm gonna i'm gonna give you two examples and they're sort of my favorites up there um one of which is the dwarf bread and cherry pratchett which is weaponized yes. too tough to eat but boy you know watch out for a, a biscuit it can get you when you're not looking in battle the stone then, of stone yes, yes. All sorts of uh, variations uh -huh. there, and uh, by the, the way, I, go ahead. I, I just want to give a shout out to the chat room. It's it's active as heck. It's awesome. Go on. So <laughs> we're, we're going to get fun. We're going to get comments uh, from the chat in, in a little bit. Well, I was going to say, and then the every flavor bean. Um, oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, was one of the things that stuck with me uh most of the possible candies because it seemed of you know of course i had jelly bellies as a kid let's take it to an extreme but does anybody have any fun well see i'll say, say fun food or drink that really stuck with you from any stories i mean that one that came to reality or, or either one fiction? Okay. either one well there's a wonderful drink called nig which was um I forget exactly who did it, but it is a an alcohol where you take a sip and all of a sudden you get a splitting headache and everything is awful. And you drink more of it and it just gets worse. And then you go to bed and you wake up the next morning and you have the wonderful anti-hangover. It's backwards gym. So you, <laughs> you start off with the hangover and you end up with the euphoria afterwards. That sounds like Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> Except you never get to the euphoria. True. I think one uh, that always intrigued me as a, as a kid growing up and, every, and everything was the idea that, you know, being a real big Star Trek fan, the Klingon ale and how it was so strong and had an effect. And then as getting into biology and chemistry as I got older, the idea that a food or a wine or a liquor from another planet would have different chemicals and different compositions that might have an absolutely destructive or different effect to us than it would to the natives. I mean, think about how hard in historic history alcohol has hit cultures that have not really seen it in that way before. Yeah, and but other cultures would planet. share the same chemistry on the same yes. planet. Right. But here you go to another complete... planet, it would even be worse. <laughs> or, or... or have no effects at all. Right. Yeah. There are an awful lot of stories of things that are normal to us having bad effects on other people. Right. Um, well, we really know that, that I mean, we it's think real. It's just normal is incredibly addictive. Right. Uh, Nutmeg for the reptile invaders in uh, the World War series by uh, 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 Harry uh, Turtledove. Yes. Yes. Nut nutmeg affects the, the invaders incredibly strangely and activates things in them that they have never experienced before. And we're like, nutmeg? What? Hmm. But, but, but at high enough dosages, nutmeg is hallucinogenic to humans too. <laughs> but it has like a, you need like a lot. At and high the, enough doses, a dose, lot of things. Yeah. The dose is very close to the um, <laughs> Uh, hallucinogenic dose as happens with many things well i'll tell you something that sounded fun in the story uh so when i was younger i read the snow queen 
and mm -hmm. they talked about Turkish delight. Oh, Benji. Yeah, T Turkish delight was like really pretty amazing. I like to talk about how much he loved Turkish delight. When I finally got old enough to have mm. Turkish delight, oh my God, that stuff's awful. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is it? Actually, you're, you were thinking of uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's, oh, sorry. that's yeah, where yeah, that I was is. Thinking, I, I was thinking of Lion, Witch, and wasn't the snow yeah. I, I, I had yeah. a, a similar Turkish? disappointment. Turkish Show delight it. is a, uh, I think it's, it's not gelatin, but sometimes they use gelatin. It's, it's like a gelatinous uh, sweet that's incredibly sweet with rose water. And uh, uh, the first time I've had it, it's like, I, I swear, I don't know how anybody eats this without losing teeth right away. But to be <laughs> fair, a lot of childhood candies are like that. Yeah. You go to the candy aisle that was wonderful when you were a kid and try to taste it now and big <laughs> Turkish delight has also been made with hashish so that uh, as well as being uh, very sweet, it's also been hallucinogenic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. But that's not what we generally see and I don't think it's what Lewis was talking about. <laughs> well, he's He's religious about it, right? He's, he's, uh, was, he at, was he particularly, do you know if he was particularly judgmental about substances? I don't think he was. Anglicans are not generally very strongly so, and he was definitely yeah. Anglican. Okay. <laughs> well, how about if we go from uh, fun to strange? Anything come to mind if we're looking at, or, or things that you would have liked to see expanded, besides obviously the size of the bottle, oh. Jake? <laughs> well, uh, when it comes to- I'm strange, a big so, person, come on. Well, I'll talk about it in terms of like, um, when, they, when people try to show science fiction food on movies or TV, and when they want to talk about strange, they always show the horned melon. The Kiwano mm -hmm. melon. Have you guys ever mm -hmm. seen this thing? Oh, yeah. I've eaten it. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I. Well, I don't think it's particularly tasty as a food, but as as a melon, it's it's fine. But it's very photogenic. It's got all these horns on it. It's orange on the outside, bright green on the inside. Um, it should great make for great TV. But goodness gracious, if you want to show strange, why do you keep showing this one same fruit? Like. <laughs> Every Star Trek show shows it. Every Star Trek show shows it. Except for the ones that have colored Play-Doh. Yeah, uh, that's true. Well, and then there's <laughs> durian, you know, which uh, is also very spiky and is a fruit that regularly kills people by falling on them. <laughs> Durians are this big, and they really look dangerous. Well, they are. They, the, the shell is hard enough to uh, be used as a helmet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but the king, king of fruits. I guess one of the questions <laughs> would arise, and Ricky, you could, I think you would be able to speak to this. The idea of, we talk about food pairings with wines and alcohols of sorts. Is there a reason why certain alcohols go best with certain foods? Is there a, is there a, a complementary chemical flavoring that appeals to human taste is I mean yeah when you're drunk you eat anything <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to comment <laughs> uh, no the, so the, the whole idea there is that alcohol itself it's not just the alcohol but usually the, the drink that it goes with um, has a whole bunch of accessory compounds and um, so there's a concept of flavor and taste. There are two different things. Taste is there's the, the set number of receptors. So salty, sweet, bitter, so on and so forth. Uh, umami. Flavor, uh, umami is a taste, but flavor is actually mostly smell. It's, it involves your olfactory bulb. It's, it's aromas, things coming up your uh, upper nasal cavity. And also the, one of the reasons why tying it to our current pandemic situation, one of the symptoms to uh, COVID-19 is the loss of the ability to smell and consequently all the flavors in the life around you. 
Uh, uh, Ricky, I have a question about that. So I've actually seen that listed as a loss of taste and smell. And I'm yes. wondering if it's because people lose the smell, they lose more taste, or is it actually both separately? It's, it's, it's actually they lose the sense of smell, and therefore you lose the flavor of things. Mm -hmm. But technically, you can taste things. You can taste salt. You can taste sweetness. But without the flavor of things, things lose their character. Right, so well, um, strawberries. Um, I've been given an example to me. Are you familiar with that suggestion? That no, if you can't, go. if you can't smell strawberries, uh, then the taste is certainly much diminished. Oh yes, that's that's true of like almost anything. Um, I think without the sense of smell, a potato and an apple is essentially the same thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly what I was going to point out. That's an yeah. old. Yeah, an old, old their nose and then and um, nobody would drink coffee and yeah no. <laughs> so <laughs> usually like the concept of wine and stuff like this, because it's an it's an alcohol it evaporates at a lower temperature at about a temperature body temperature and so your nasal your uh, olfactory bulb gets saturated with all these molecules and it can interact with whatever foods you're having at the same time uh, and one of the people on the chat commented that uh, the congeners and whiskey changed the flavor of a lot of things. I had a sample of a whiskey, and I have no idea which one it was, years ago, a cask strength whiskey at a uh, liquor store in San Francisco, which had the oddest taste experience I've ever had. I took a sip of it, and the middle of my tongue basically vanished, and I could only <laughs> taste things on the outside edges. Well, actually, you know, I've had that happen where like all feeling in my mouth disappeared when I took a drink of a particular. <laughs> this, this wasn't the whole mouth. That I could understand. Yeah. But the, the localization of this yeah, was something that I never heard anyone else talk about. It was really strange. Did you lose feeling in your toes too? <laughs> oh, it's not, it's, it almost sounds like a slight allergic reaction to whatever was in the alcohol. I didn't have it with any of the other ones that they were sampling. Yeah, it could, no. but it might have been something unique to yeah. that, 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 yeah. what they were. They're just, they're just strong flavors because, uh, like, mm -hmm. Seattle chocolates or the, local chocolate factory, one of the, did, one of them. Did actually, you wake up missing a kidney? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. <laughs> they, they, yeah. Well, I was going to say for Tom, so the, the chocolates, uh, they actually work to have a different experience as you're eating it, uh, different parts of your tongue. And there's always that thing, but they're working specifically to get flavors for the tip of your tongue and the back of your tongue. So maybe the alcohol folks were doing the same thing. It's possible. Well, how about speaking of alien and taste, uh, there are all sorts of possibilities like tasting, you know, with your fingers that humans don't do but certainly there are other animals with taste receptors in other places. And uh, some interesting aliens and alien customs out there for greeting people. I, I mean, in fiction. I haven't actually, uh, you know, met any the, real aliens that I the know salt of. The salt, the salt creature from Star Trek that put its hands on your face and sucks all the salt out of your body through your uh, skin. Remember that one? It leaves oh, yeah. rings. Okay. I just want to be friends. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a lot of weird things. There's a story by Tony Boucher called QUR about building robots, where the way he succeeds in getting people to accept a robot that doesn't look humanoid is that he develops one that can actually be a better bartender than any of the humanoid ones. Faster or better. It produces, there's a cocktail that has to be produced for the Martian ambassador, which is done in a very specific way, and humans can never learn how to do it exactly right, because it requires a very specific flick of the bottle of <laughs> Martian liquor to get exactly a certain amount in. And I, if you do too much, it tastes dry and terrible, and if you do too little, it's not there. Tastes almost exactly, but nothing like tea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it could be something like, uh, uh, are you familiar with miracle fruit, miracle berries? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I, I actually did a panel on that one time where I actually brought the miracle berry powder and got everyone trying it. 
Um, um, tell us a little bit about Miracle Berries before you... Oh, okay. Okay, Miracle Berries are an interesting thing. This is not fictional. This actually is real. Uh, Miracle Berries are a West African fruit. It was originally... Uh, uh, I, I think the idea was that um, the the natives would, would chew on the berry and spit into the meal to make it taste better. Um, what it turns out is that miracle berries uh, alter your taste perception such that anything sour tastes sweet. Hmm. So if you're cooking and you're chewing it and you're spitting it in there and you're tasting it and it tastes sweet to you, but you serve it to other people and it just tastes sour. <laughs> um, uh, so this effect is really eerie because you, you, you take it and it's almost instantaneously lemons taste like candy. Uh, vinegar is sweet. The worst wine you can think of actually tastes okay. Uh, hmm. Don't eat cheese. Cheese is awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, how it works, and this was only figured out in the last few years, is um, the the protein in, in miracle berries, miraculin, uh, is, is a super sweet protein. Uh, it binds to the sweetness receptor with a higher affinity than sugar does. Hmm. So when it fits in, it actually stimulates it much more than, than, and that's actually the principle of how like a lot of our artificial sweeteners work. How come there's zero calories? It's because they can taste sweeter than actual sugar. So you only need a little bit of it effectively zero calories and get still the same equivalent. So three so of those pink packs aren't needed in a cup of coffee. Most of the stuff in that is just filler. Mm -hmm. Like there's like literally probably like two milligrams of, of uh, um, what the phenyl, uh, whatever the compound is, it's equal is. And the rest of it is just cornstarch. Like you don't- So why aren't we using- carry. Why aren't we miracle. using miracle berries? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, because miracle berries only taste sweet when it's acidic. Hmm. So what happens is that it floats around your, your taste buds. You put in something acidic. It folds into the super sweet conformation, locks into place, and now it tastes sweet. So hmm. it blocks out your ability to taste the sour and you because your sweetness receptor just kicks off. But does it a lemon effect, still taste like a lemon? A lemon tastes like lemon candy. Huh. So you'll get the, all like the lemon aromatics and stuff like that, but the sourness is gone. Hmm. Instead, it's intensely sweet. So I've seen people like devour lemons after being on this, like one after the other, and then they get like hyperacidosis because guess what? <laughs> They've been eating all this acid. They just can't taste it. Yeah. Um, there is one story and there's one episode of CSI where this was the, this was the murder weapon. Basically the, 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 uh, victim was dozed with, uh, with, with miracle berries and then got fed with an Arsenic. acid that uh, they, they took it down. They didn't taste it. It just like died. Mm -hmm. And that was like the, it was stupid. It, it was definitely not the way it works, but. <laughs> you can get a milder effect um, with artichokes in the same way and with um, asparagus. Artichokes, artichokes, they both artichokes change the taste thing. Yeah. Yes. of things you eat after them. Yes. Wait, artichokes Yeah, everything, and... everything tastes better after you eat asparagus and artichokes. Because <laughs> <laughs> they taste like But it, it, it does terrible. change the flavor. It, change, it changes the way the flavor is perceived. Hmm. Okay, now just keep in mind that there is something called uh, gymnemic acid, which is the exact opposite of miraculin. It blocks your ability to taste anything sweet. Uh, why? So, huh? I mean, not why does it, but and why would anybody want to consume this? Uh, it's used Humor. By your, <laughs> I didn't say why. Produce your friends. Yes. Uh, former friends. <laughs> former friends. Uh, Soon but, to be former friends. Um, they, they were, uh, it's, it was used in Ayurvedic medicine, so whatever reason you might have wanted to do it in Ayurvedic medicine. But also, like, I think some people use it as a diet aid because once you put it on, then nothing tastes good. Life is gray and <laughs> awful. And uh, that we wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> 
that would be a story in and of itself. If you go there and write a story about the fact that, you know, you've lost your ability to smell or taste sweetness. So do you... <laughs> well, so since you mentioned stories, here's uh, to give it another twist. What would people like to see uh, if you could invent anything in terms of food? If if you've ever mm. used food or drink, besides obviously something that will eliminate the hangover. And I noticed we had uh, a mention of the oh god of hangovers from, from yes. Terry Pratchett's Discworld. He <laughs> does get the hangover for you, but Thanks. thoughts on that at all? Well, actually I was going to, I wanted to cycle back to one other thing first. Yeah. Uh, Cord Wiener Smith's Scanners Live in Vain. Um, Scanners are people who have basically had everything that connects the world disconnected from them so that they can live out in uh, this weird space type thing and they can turn things back on with what's called a cranch wire and people are rediscovering old foods and old stuff and um, his wife cooks lamb chops for him and <clears throat> he goes under it and he realizes that the smell of meat cooking is the same smell he's gotten from people being burned to death around him, and he completely freaks out. Well, it was pork she was cooking for him, and long pig. No, well, no, no, it was <laughs> lamb chops. It was lamb chops. Whatever. It's yeah. not. A, it's not a cow. It's just the same thing to me. We have a whole religion around lamb chops. Uh, oh. Uh. <laughs> yes. Well, don't tell Sherry Lewis, okay? <laughs> I see we have a suggestion of bacon tree uh, okay. from our chat. Mm -hmm. I'll throw one out there, just uh, something that I like the idea of, a, of a, as a kid in that um, you have candies that will turn your whole mouth purple uh, mm -hmm. or whatever, which actually can be useful if you're trying to create an alien costume and you want to oh, yes. make things look a little bit odd. Um, but we also have now genetic experiments where we're putting um, bioluminescence in various animals. So like the glow-in-the-dark bunny rabbit. I'm not saying eat bunny rabbits, but uh, I always like the idea of a glow-in-the-dark candy, not something that glowed in the dark per se, but that would cause either, you know, your mouth or Honestly, maybe temporarily somebody start glowing. I think, I think Hopefully we that would do that. We yeah, can't do that. You know which one does? Quinine. Yeah. Quinine glows in the in black light. So. But how much would you have to have? Uh, Not very well, much. For, for, but it's also incredibly bitter. So you, really so you have some miracle water water first. Burn. Miracle berry yeah. first. <laughs> Add and the water certainly burn. glows in black light. There are a lot of things that glow in black light. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's really what these glow in the dark. Uh, uh, foods are really um like the what do you call glow in the dark there's actually glow fish it's not probably not the rabbit but it's it's an actual fish with green green fluorescent protein there's a youtube video of a guy who's actually eating it because it is a fish you can eat alive and it'll glow as he chews it oh, uh, oh. <laughs> well i got i mean i guess the curiosity question the, the the side note here is how long does the glowing effect last for for the for the green fluorescent protein yeah as long as it's alive still so the moment you cook it it's done yeah okay so you'd have to eat it as sushi you'd have to eat it as sushi or a living fish okay swallowing goldfish no longer a frat boy side I, I, also if you chew on wintergreen lifesavers uh I, they do produce a bio a, a luminescence uh, if you know, you I, eat I enough... in the dark myself i watched okay it but but I, I like the idea. Let's see if we can fabricate glow in the dark foods for you. I, I will do a little bit of research and see what I can find. And Excellent. Because because this is all based on biological luminescence, mm -hmm. and that is a problem because it has to be alive to glow. So let's see if we can find something that's actually chemically uh, chemically stable, so you can add it to so, and, and we'll or radioactive. Around. There's, well, a and not toxic. <laughs> There's a very short term uh, bioluminescence, which is the one that um, fireflies make, which is easily synthesized in the organic chem lab. I know because I did it. Um, oh, that's that's, luci that's luciferase. Yeah, luci luciferase. You don't have it. Doesn't have to be alive. It's uh, very fleeting how long it glows, but it's still it, it, really cool to make. It glows depending on the amount of ATP around. 
Yeah. And uh, it, it, and it's also, well, it's gotten good. It's gotten better. It's actually not that bright. So if you were in a crowded room, people probably can't see it. But you can look at it under a microscope. So, Ricky, well, after, yeah. after well, you synthesize... It's really visibly glowing in the daylight. <laughs> <laughs> after you synthesize or help us synthesize the glow-in-the-dark uh, food, something yeah. that causes us to glow, then we jump in the time machine. We go, go back and, you know, frighten the natives or intimidate the natives into, you know... Burning us, as a, burning us as a witch? Great. Sure. <laughs> You're already burning. You're already glowing. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we're um, getting up towards 40 minutes, and we've had lots of things from the chat, uh, all, not all of which I've been able to follow. Karen. Um, Crunchy Frog is what I'm seeing there from uh, mm -hmm. uh, Monty Python, of course. <laughs> Well, from college, one of the things we did that, that kind of crossed people over to the idea of eating insects is you take an insect and you coat it in chocolate because then it's not really an insect, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... Chocolate-covered bees, chocolate-covered ants. Right. Oh, my uh, God. Th th that works? I can chocolate-covered oh yeah. anything and it's not that anymore? Right. Yeah. yeah. The only thing that <laughs> doesn't work try, is bacon. Try chocolate with them and eat them mascara. Chocolate-covered bacon is just not pleasant it's it was the greatest taste in the world somehow ruined when mixed i don't understand it's so wrong well there's an old comment that there are three foods that have really amazing smells baking bread frying bacon and um coffee and of those three only coffee is a cheat because it doesn't taste at all like it smells <laughs> no no it doesn't uh, I have more smells that are interesting than that, but that, that sort of betrays uh, a really European-centric view of the culture. Food is a cultural expression after all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when we talk about what's weird or what's interesting, it's usually a signal of what the author's cultural background is. Uh, I mean, not very, because we, our science fiction tends to be very centered towards Europe. We don't get to discuss what goes on elsewhere or what's, what's considered weird. In China, when, when I first uh, got like a cheeseburger is like the weirdest thing to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Well, sense. there are a whole lot of people who would not eat what's right up behind you there, Dr. Ricky. Oh, yeah, well. Because there are a lot, a lot of people who just will not eat raw fish. And a lot of people miss out, and that's okay with me? Yeah. Or for the rest of they, us? They can have my hummus. I'll take their raw fish. <laughs> I'm um, allergic, yeah, you know, dietarily sensitive to to chickpeas. So, fine, you can have all the hummus, but I won't eat. Well, Ricky, can you pull out any examples uh, from different perspectives? Uh, certainly, there's lots. I mean, food's pretty basic to our culture, but how about yeah. any any fictional examples or non-fictional examples that come to mind? Um, so, I think so. In, in, there's a story that I read uh, a while back. I think Paul De Filippo wrote about wrote it. And it's, a very, it's a short story about going to another planet. Um, and the thing that we sort of don't take into account is that even if another planet uses the same proteins and amino acids as we do, um, in all likelihood, the combinations will not be anything compatible with our metabolism. So it's kind of a weird idea that people would go to another planet and like, oh, I can just catch the local wildlife and roast it mm -hmm. and eat it. Um, in all likelihood, we'll have allergic reactions to it. And the point of view of the story is that it's based on, I think the protagonists were Japanese. And so, you know, and their mission was to try to find what local wildlife is edible. And they've been on this mission for like <laughs> three years and the nat when the natives they're working with finally find something, just like one fish-like thing, and they had sashimi. It was wonderful. And it was the last mating pair left. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a story in which the alien ambassadors are bird-like beings, and everything is going just swimmingly. And then there's a big accident, and one of the ambassadors gets fried uh, by an electrical bolt. And all of a sudden, the people around start salivating and <laughs> going over to eat it because <laughs> they can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. <laughs> Everybody loves chicken. 
Uh, hey. <laughs> I think we say that because we have no other reference. Chicken yeah. is the most, uh, I, I think there's a, there's a statistic that if we went through the fossil record like a, a 10,000 years from now, there would be more chicken bones than human bones uh, on Earth. Right. And we would have assumed that the chicken, like, oh, well, we, the future paleontologists would have gathered that the dominant species were chickens. Well, except that the chicken bones had been exposed to cooking and the human bones hadn't. Well, that's, a, that's their, uh, they, sac they perform sacrifices. To oh, okay. <laughs> it, it, there are probably more rat bones than human bones. But here's the thing about that, too, is when we talk about, when we talk about chicken, if you take a chicken and you cook it, you know, you have a chicken breast and you eat it. It tastes completely different than, say, a partridge or a wild bird, you know. I mean, the, the domestication definitely changes the, the no, flavor. No, no. So, so this tells you a little bit about your cultural background because of the way you cooked it. So okay. uh, because The way in, it's raised actually has something to do with it, too. Uh, but I think a lot, a lot more to do with the way it's cooked, uh, because um, so there's a style of cooking in China and in Indonesia. This this thing called pho, and what it is, it's almost any meat. You cook it until it turns into a powder. And you can go into a lot of stores here. You can buy like there's pork pho, fish pho, um, uh, chicken pho. To be honest, they they all taste the same. <laughs> Because it's what it's a way of using leftover, you know, out of uh, it might not be the freshest meat at all, but once you cook it this far, who cares? It's just protein. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, it's because of of that backdrop. Um, in the hands of a, of of the, on the on your cultural background, we you know, the U.S. the the uh, Western cultural background about cooking meat in a high, uh, quick cook is sort of the standard. But a lot of places would boil the meat. Uh, you know, you take whatever scrawny animal you have, you have to cook it for a while in moist conditions. Mm -hmm. And um, it might not come out the way it is. The, it's the like modern, sorry. It's like sous vide? No, no sous vide no. so sophisticated. Yeah. No, literally a pot. <laughs> it's, literally it a looks pot more like the difference there. between the way you cook brisket and the way you cook steak. <laughs> You know, brisket. Is that what you're talking about? I mean, I guess the, the question to me, the question I'm asking, Ricky, and when you say a quick cook, are you talking about the difference as far as, I mean, are you talking about levels as far as rare, medium rare? Or, no, no, I'm know? talking about just that style of uh, where it's a dry heat, you throw, you mm -hmm. throw a piece of uh, animal on it, and you're not waiting five, six hours, you just yeah. pull it off when you're done, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, but stuff that's cooked in a slow cooker is different from stuff that's cooked in a fry pan. Yeah. But I guess, is that is that really that different? I mean, I, I, yes. I mean this, is my, this is my limit of knowledge as far as you're saying it's, it's a cultural background. Isn't that kind of the undercurrent cultural background of cooking proteins? Or is that, am I wrong in that? Uh, you're wrong in that. Okay. So, I mean, like, you look <laughs> elsewhere, uh, so there are places in, in uh, China, for example, are notable for you just have a giant pot of boiling animal parts and as you fish them out as you eat it and then you throw more in there and it keeps boiling. There are things that have been boiling for like 25, 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> I need to take a very quick break. I'll be right back. Well, actually, we're coming up on 45 uh, yeah. minutes. So okay. I think... Uh, you're welcome to take your break, Tom, but I think actually we getting on time to wrap it up. Um, okay, I'll be right back. Yeah, I want to open it up to the audience. Yeah, yeah let's have the audience say, say something. Uh, there are lots of wonderful ideas, but anybody have any, any questions or things that you'd like to throw out there sort of at the end? Give folks a second for that. So you said Stu has been cooking 24 Days. I mean, are you serious? And the stuff's been in there cooking for that long? Years. You're you're not joking. I'm not joking. Like so the eternal boiling stews. Well, before we get too sidetracked on that, somebody's pointed out we never did actually address the question <laughs> I had on the Good slide. What does go with uh, dragon steak? 
thoughts on that? I'll say, um, I know one of our audience members had suggested blood wine would be the perfect pairing. Uh, uh, I think something medicinal for the burn. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying Pepto-Bismo, never mind with the no, wine. Dragon <laughs> is going to be lizard. Lizard is closest to fowl. Therefore, it's likely to be something that's relatively like a white wine. Um, probably, you know, leapfrog milk. I'd say it depends on how the dragon was cooked. Uh, it's, it's dragon mm -hmm. steak. Uh, so um, I would say uh, chocolate milkshake. <laughs> I, think it, I think it would depend on the dragon, because if you look at the yeah. dragon type, if you're looking at a red dragon, you're talking about something that uses a fire-based a fire based breath weapon, and therefore it's going to be some sort of com combustible that's going to be diffused in the flesh. Whereas uh, if you have Olivia, something if you like a black it, dragon, it would be an acidic. If you, have, if you have a fire type dragon, would you be able to cook it as a steak? Almost. Maybe it's self cooked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, tartar. Tartar. I'm going to tartar that one. <laughs> I see another question actually asking if anybody can think of examples from literature where there are important drinks that are not alcohol paired with eating or associated with eating foods. Uh, milk and the uh, Maasai. Mm -hmm. Milk so and cooking. About, well, from whatever. literature. From right, me. but you think about that, that, that tie in, you know, going back to milk so, and cooking, like Thomas said. Um, also, blood is occasionally used as um, something to drink with certain ritual foods. Um, so I'm not sure. Is butter beer supposed to be alcoholic? No, because they're all minors. Uh, there you go. Butter beer. Yeah. What the hell? Goes with anything. Yeah. You got to read your Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> I don't read Harry Potter. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and certainly Prospector Special by Robert Sheckley, you know, the, this guy is out prospecting on a world and he makes a big find and orders the Prospector Special, which is as big as a swimming pool and all these other things, all these other wonderful adjectives, and it turns out to be water. Well, because that's pretty special. Unable to get. And yeah. then there is the most important uh, you know, galactically important beverage of all time. P. Earl Grey hot. <laughs> Stop it. <Yes. laughs> you know what Patrick Stewart's favorite tea is? He better English not be. Breakfast. <laughs> he doesn't uh. particularly like Earl Grey. <laughs> you said English breakfast, Tom? Yes. I do not with like that. Earl Grey. Can't blame him for that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, watered down coffee. Ah. <laughs> Someone give this guy the spice melange. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, what would you uh, send folks off with if you had to toast? Um, I'll say, you know, Pan Galactic Gargle Blaster. Uh, nobody would be vertical after that, but. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you know, that's what I'd have to toast everybody with, uh, especially these days. And then you just wake up maybe after a month or so of hangover. There, there's a drink that they used to serve at the Magic Cellar called a levitation, which was, uh, you know, after two oh, of them, you were. <laughs> I like is it. This, is, this, is this our, our sign-off toast for, yes. for the session? Okay. Uh, uh, Jake, you want to do it? Because you've got all the, all the booze. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I... I tell you, I Romulan ale would have to be the one that I'd go with. I mean, it, it's illegal. <laughs> it's it's it, you know, it's illegal for everybody. It's blue, and you know, a couple drinks of it, and yeah, it's a month later, and you're like, where the hell am I? <laughs> Which is kind of appealing right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> so um, I would sign everyone off tonight with a glass of milk with rose water because it is ramadan at the moment uh. and that's how you break the fast in ramadan is a glass of milk with rose water and some dates so excellent and i would sign everyone off with a glass of chateau lafitte rothschild 
78, 1878, <laughs> because that's what uh, Neil Gaiman has hobgadling drink with dream in the final time they meet in his dreams. All right, I'm gonna wave.